Good day, biblical counselors. Well, uh, this is really our last lecture um, that you're going to receive. It's a little bit longer. We're going to try to do all of sexual addiction today, a very important lecture. I really encourage you to uh, write the notes. We will not be able to um, give you the entirety of this lecture. Then I think there's one on spiritual growth as well, and uh, we're not going to really cover that. I think we've covered that through all of our lectures in the practicality of the acrostics and the things that I've given you. So I've never covered that last lecture on spiritual growth because I believe I've given that in every lecture. However, um, there will be some blanks that we're going to jump over. If you would like a complete copy of all of the notes, if you go to your files, Brother Bundy will download all of the, the notes that I haven't given you in the sexual uh, issues lecture as well as the spiritual growth one as well. So you can get all of those. Uh, we're going to go quite quickly and uh, we're going to do something we haven't done in any of our classes on videotape. I have before every time I videotape, I always pray. Uh, but I haven't with um, you as a class. We're going to do that right now because of the, the sensitivity of the issue and the importance of the issue, and that is sexual addiction. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then let's get ready for an incredible lecture uh, to help people change their behavior biblically. Everyone together, what is the definition of biblical counseling? That's right, changing behavior biblically. And we're going to show you how to do that when somebody has an addiction to sexual issues or they're struggling with sexual identity and issues as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this semester. I thank you for the students that you put in the class. Lord, I do believe that they have received material, whether it was at home or in Revels 207, that could help them and help others with issues in their life and others that need to change biblically. Father, I thank you for the privilege it has been to teach. But now, Lord, today in this lecture, would you bring a soberness, um, a conviction, a challenge, and a comfort uh, to that which is needed to each one of these counselors but also, Lord, to the people that they will minister to in the years to come. May this be a, a lecture that is used mightily. I thank you for the privilege it is to teach the material we're about to look at, and I pray it will change lives. And uh, thank you for this chance. Now, in Jesus' name, we pray. And God's counselor said, amen. All right, let's look at lecture 11. Uh, sexual issues. Uh, introduction. Sex dominates our culture today. It is the driving force on television, in magazines, in advertisement, in literature, music, the theater, movies, art, and even everyday conversation. The heathenistic lifestyle has become more and more acceptable and even admired. Not only, think about that, the more sexually perverted someone is, almost the more popular they are. Uh, not only must we deal with the problems of premarital and extramarital relationships, but we also face the issues of homosexuality, rape, uh, all kinds, incest, child molestation, you name it, uh, it's there. It will be impossible to give adequate time in one lecture, and especially in the format that we have right now, to give everything. But I think you need to understand the importance of this. Uh, the Bible and sex apart from marriage, Roman numeral one. We will cover large A. While the physical relationship was created by God for protect for procreation, there is more to the sexual act than just the physical. Instincts and biological creation. Yeah, sexual activity is way more than just a biological function. Uh, Lewis uh, Smeads in Sex for Christians writes, Sexuality throbs within us as a movement toward relationship, intimacy, and companionship. We're not animals. And sexual activity is way more than an animal function. Um, unhealthy sexuality distorts God's plan and destroys intimacy and communication, and it does. 
If you take that which is to burn in a fireplace and you take that fire out of that, it will be destructive and destroy. It is self-centered, often manipulates, controls, and hurts another person. The experience may be pleasurable. And this is where, this is it. There is no question that illicit sexual activity is pleasurable for a time. But the consequences are unlike any other sin of what it does inside and outside to a person. Uh, large B, the Bible is plain on the subject. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled. It is God who created sexual intimacy. It is God who created this. And yet, if you take it out of the boundaries that God has set, there will always be damage. There will always be consequences. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Nobody is an exception to that. Whether you're a child of God or not, there is no exception to that. God has placed a boundary around sexual act, and that boundary is marriage between a man and a woman. Anything outside this boundary is not in God's plan and therefore is sinful. Large C. The Bible uses two words to describe sex outside of marriage. Number one is fornication. It's mentioned 47 times uh, in the New Testament. Now we're going to jump down to number two. Adultery is the other word. And this will always, both of these will always provoke judgment of God. That's that last blank there. 1 Corinthians 6, I think... Um, it would do us well to read these scriptures. I'm going to jump down kind of into the middle. Now, the body is not for fornication, but, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members with a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he that hath joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith, he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. See, this is really interesting. Sexual of fornication, sexual adultery has consequences not only to the mind, the heart, the spirit, and the soul, but also to the body as well. Um, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have God. Ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. A large D, sex outside of marriage involves sinful thinking. No illicit sexual activity will occur that hasn't, first of all, occurred in the mind. Now, a lot of people say, well, if I just think about it, it's not really sin. I have today with me a Diet Coke, a can of Diet Coke. And um, I'm going to do something with this can of Diet Coke. I'm not going to drink it. I'm not going to sip it. I'm not going to taste it. But notice what I'm going to do. I am going to take this Diet Coke and I am going to open it. This can, I have not tasted it. I haven't even smelt it. I have not touched it. But this can of soda will never be the same now that it's opened. And I want to tell you about pornography. A lot of people justify pornography in their life by saying, I haven't touched anybody else. I haven't done anything with anyone else. I haven't taken my body and used it with anyone else. You get into pornography, you will never be the same. This can will never be the same. You come back in a day or so, it'll be flat. It will have lost its fizz. Why? Because somebody touched it? No. Somebody drank it? No. Because it was opened. And you open your mind to pornography you will never be the same. So sexual activity begins, first of all, in the mind. I'll look down to large F. Sex apart from marriage involves individual sexual self-gratification. 
And I truly believe that whether you say, well, nobody knows about this, God does, God sees it, and I will tell you, you're destroying your own life with your self-gratification. We call it masturbation. You may call it whatever. I'm telling you, the sin begins in the thought life as well. Let's go to Roman numeral two, the causes of sex outside of marriage. I wanted you to get some of these causes. Large A is environmental stimulation. There is uh, some things in our environment that causes us to get involved with wrong sexual activity. Number one is just the social pressure of it. Uh, the idea that everybody's doing it, which is not true, but, but that is the, what is promoted out there. If you're a virgin and you're a, you know, later in your teens or you're a college student still a virgin, something's wrong with you. That social pressure causes wrong sexual activity. Sexual convenience. It's just unbelievable. The convenience it is right now for to, to satisfy an improper self-gratification sexual appetite. Uh, number three, changing values. Things are changing. What we used to call sin, we don't call it that anymore. Therefore, it doesn't mean it's not sin just because we put a different label on it, but then therefore it makes we kind of justify it. So one is social pressure, two is sexual convenience, three is changing values all under environmental um, uh, stimulation. And then I'll give you number four too is inappropriate education. We've been taught wrong, which changes the values. Inappropriate education. Then large B, there's internal pressure. Whoa, God's given you hormones. God's given you things in your body that are activated now, and there's a there's a place to release that. It's called marriage. But you may go years not being married with that with that internal pressure. A um, couple things under that. Number two. Uh, there are several internal heart pressures. I wanted to, you to get these. Small a, curiosity. Yeah, there's no question. There's a curiosity of things. Uh, chances are if you got into pornography at 10, 11, 12 years of age, it was curiosity that got you into that. Small b, your identity and self-esteem. I'm going to get more value if I have this physical intimacy. I'm going to get this more, I'm going to get more value. I'm being loved. It's not love, it's lust. Um, so identity of self-esteem as well. C, the search for intimacy, that desire to have that relationship opens the door physically for improper sexual conduct. Uh, D is very interesting. And I, in counseling young people over the years, I believe this is, I think this is bigger than most people think. Rebellion and escape. I think a lot of teenagers lose their purity get involved with sexual activity, not because of curiosity, not because they, they want a fulfilled relationship. You know what? They know it's rebellion against their parents. They know it's rebellion against their church and they believe a lie and they actually lose their purity because of rebellion and escape. And small e, I don't think we can discount it. And that is satanic influence. If there is an area that Satan attacks, it's in the area of sexual pr pressure. Taking that which God gave and abusing it by taking it out of marriage and out of its boundaries of marriage and bringing it in. And I think Satan is very much involved as well. Roman numeral three, the effects of sex outside of marriage. Ultimately, any sin will be punished by God and this area will be no different. Proverbs chapter 5, Proverbs 6, and Proverbs 7 all talk. There are 10 moral consequences for immorality. There are 10 consequences given in Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 about the person who takes that which is given for the boundary of marriage and takes it out of marriage. Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 give 10 consequences of immorality. Study it sometime. Number one under large B, emotional effects. And large B is much of the effects of sexual sin, however, comes much sooner than later. Uh, there is an emotional effect. First of all, guilt, if nothing else. Look at small b under this. Sexual freedom produces a deadening of the conscience. And this is true. You keep 
involved with pornography, you keep involved with an ungodly relationship with someone from the opposite gender or the same gender, and you stay in that, it deadens your spirituality. Um, I'm going to skip two, three, uh, four. Uh, again, if you want those, will be uh, Brother Bundy will put those in the file uh, to get these notes. Uh, I want to go to Roman numeral four now, counseling the sexual issues. And I want to go down to large A is look at your own attitudes and values. We're under Roman numeral four, large A, counseling the sexual issues. Look at your own attitudes. And I put down, I want to jump down to number four. The right attitude is difficult, particularly if we know the people that are involved. When you're counseling these people that are involved, I think you're going to find of all the areas that we've been counseling, I think maybe one of the hardest is sexual problems um, because maybe you, you're, you know the person that you're involved with. Small a under this. We must show love without compromising. Love rejoices not in iniquity. And it, we, we definitely love the person, but we cannot be tolerant of their sexual activity that should only be in marriage. And they've taken it out. We must show love without compromising. Small b, we must show compassion without denying reality. They're going to get judged for this. I love you too much to allow you to stay into this. We must show compassion without denying reality. And small c, we must be direct without becoming vindictive. And that is true, too. We can't become angry at what they're involved in as well. Large B, listen with sensitivity. They need to see that in your eyes, in your face, in your spirit, in your posture. This is very difficult for them to talk to you about. Listen with sensitivity. Basically, we're going to skip the next page, and we're going to go all the way to E which is absolutely important. So we're under large E now, under counseling the sexual issues. Large E is demonstrate forgiveness. They have got to sense that you forgive them for what they do. Condemnation, and is that not what Christ did with the woman caught in adultery? He does not condone that sin. He does not want that, that woman to stay in that sin at all. But there is no question, there is forgiveness. And I want to tell you something, you will never help somebody out of sexual addiction if they don't believe the hope there will be forgiveness with God. And they almost got to experience, even though they didn't do you wrong, they've got to sense a spirit of forgiveness from you. That demonstrate forgiveness involved with sexual activity is huge. Large F. Stimulate right thinking through good information. And I'm going to give you that today. The stimulate right thinking through good information. Number one, the counselor should be well rehearsed with the scriptures dealing with this area. I'm going to give you some today. Uh, and then number two, have some additional resources. And I'm going to give you that today. Materials on hand. I even have a little book here. And this book is what we're going to look at now. Um, uh, years ago, I preached a message, uh, about 20 years ago now, I preached a message on how to have victory over temptation. And I took the word victory, V-I-C-T-O-R-Y, and I gave a message. We're going to look at that right now. This is the acrostic to have victory over sexual addiction. It's just a little book. It has seven chapters in it. At the end of every chapter, there are projects there is accountability. There are projects that they can do. I encourage you. If I'm not trying to sell a book. I'm encouraging you. If you're dealing with somebody that's struggling with sexual addiction, for them to get the little book, they get it from Striving Together, you can have some. Here's what I would recommend you do in counseling, that you go through the book with them. And each chapter has projects that they're supposed to do for the next week. They come back, they do the projects, you talk about it. You should go through the book with them. So get two books, one for you and one for them. I think this will be very helpful. It, the whole book can be read in probably 45 minutes. But I encourage you to draw it over a period of time. Maybe you've only got three, four weeks with them. So maybe you would do two chapters a week. And that would be, I think the projects would not be overwhelming. 
Um, you know, it's interesting. I don't think I've ever said this before, but uh, in a lot of the counseling that we've given this semester, we've told you when you come to projects, don't overload them. If they're struggling with inferiority, don't overload them. They got to have some wins, uh, depression, whatever area it's been. I've said, don't give them too many projects. There's one area that I think it's different. In the area of overcoming sexual addiction, I actually would give them several projects because they need to stay busy. They need to be very actively involved in doing things. Um, and maybe their, their problem isn't that they're not aggressive. Maybe they're aggressive. Their intenseness has caused part of their problem. I'm telling you, if I'm, if I'm counseling someone with sexual addiction, I give them more projects than I would in some of the other areas. Uh, the other area I would say is anger. If someone you're counseling someone with anger, give them a lot of projects. They can handle a lot of, they got a lot of emotional energy of displeasure that they can use to solve the problem. And in sexual addiction, I would. In some other areas, they just need to see fear and anxiety, uh, depression. They don't need as many. So let me encourage you with that. That was, I don't think I've ever said that before, but I think there's good wisdom in that as well. So I encourage the book. This is what we're going to look at now. And this is what you're going to need to know for your final um, question on your, uh, your final exam is how would you help someone through a sexual addiction and what projects would you give them? And uh, by the way, there is one more lecture. It's only, it's not really a lecture. It's like uh, about 10, maybe yeah, about 10 minutes. And I go over how to succeed on the final exam and what the final exam is going to be. So you'll definitely want to watch that next video. Uh, let's look now at uh, the back side of your sheet on how to counsel sexual perversions. Uh, there's a lot of notes there, and if you notice, there isn't really fill in the blank. So you've got all that material you can read on your own. I think you'll find it very helpful. At the back side, at the very end, look at number two. It says the four questions. I want to talk about those. Uh, years ago, a young man came in, and he had a difficulty with same-sex attraction. And I'm going to tell you this right now. You deal with that the same way you deal with any other sexual perversion. Someone struggling with the perversion of pornography and looking at opposite gender pictures. I am going to deal with someone that has the same sex attraction the same way. Some people say, well, I was born that way. Well, let me tell you this about that statement. Yeah, you know what? You were born that way. Yes, you were. You were born with a depraved nature. And your depraved nature has a propensity to same-sex attraction. It doesn't make it right because you have a propensity towards that. It's your depravity. And we've got to help people see that it is sin. It isn't a matter, well, I, I, I've always had this inclination. Yeah, that's called your flesh. It's called sin. And that's what we're dealing with. It doesn't matter if it's same sex or opposite sex. If it's sexual perversion, it doesn't matter if it's with animals. Yeah, it's a perversion. And that's not what God wants. Whether or not you had that propensity all of your life to go that direction doesn't make it right. And that's why we got to help someone through that. And uh, there's four questions there that would help you greatly. There's one of those that I want to take a moment. Um, in that session that I had with that young man, I asked him a question. I drew a circle and I divided that circle, in a pie, into pieces. I had school and friends, job and hobbies and, and um, church and God and the sexual sin. And I asked that student this question. Is this sin a part, a separate piece of your pie, your life, or has this affected every area of your life? Now, here's something I've come to learn. It doesn't really matter what the sin is. Sexual sin doesn't matter if it's depression. It doesn't matter what, whatever it is, whatever the sin is, if they say, well, I believe it's just a part of my life and I just want help with this, they'll never have victory. You won't have victory until you realize that this one part is affecting everything every part of the whole. And it is very vitally important that they understand, no, no, no. 
We're not dealing with it a compartment of your life. This one compartment has infected your entire being in every area of your life. And until we get this right, you're going to have problems in all of these other areas. That is a very, very important question to ask a counselee. Do you believe this sin is just one area of your life or do you believe it's affected every area? Because until you believe it's infected every area of your life, you'll never see victory. Changing behavior biblically has to have a great stimulation, a motivation. I'm ruining my life. I've got to change this in my life. Now, I want to talk to you now about victory. V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. Here's your acrostic for sexual addiction. If you look under number three, V stands for vigilant. Vigilance. Put down next to that 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. <coughs> be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, excuse me, whom he may devour. Uh, 1 Peter 5.8, they've got to be vigilant. They've got to know there's a spiritual warfare. They've got to know that Satan's trying to attack them, and they have to also be vigilant of their own flesh. They can't think like, well, you know, this isn't a big deal. I'm not that important. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a huge deal. And you will never become victorious until you become alert and watchful and careful every moment of your day that you could fall into this sin. Vigilance is imperative to see victory. Number two, I, imagine the consequences. I put down uh, next to this Galatians chapter 6, Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Hey, listen, bud. You're going to reap what you sow. You continue to sow these seeds. You're going to reap later than you sowed, and you're going to reap more than you sowed. And they've got to understand that there are consequences with sexual perversion, whether it is in their mind or with their body or with another individual. And those consequences, you know what? I really want this sexual desire fulfilled. And there's pleasure when I do it. That self-gratification, there's pleasure when I do it. Yeah. But the consequences of guilt, the consequences of broken fellowship, the consequences of you destroying your ministry, your testimony, and your witness for Christ is greater than the immediate pleasure. I'm telling you, no one's going to have victory over temptation of sin and sexual activity until they see, imagine the consequences. It's not worth it. I don't want to give up my purity for a moment of pleasure in a summer night and lose my testimony and God using me down the road. Imagine the consequences. Lord, C, cry out to God. I'm going to come back to this one, but I want you to put down Psalm 34, 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Cry out to God, Psalm 34, 6. Learn how to say, God, help me in this temptation. I'll come back to that in a moment. T, take your thoughts into captivity. Take your thoughts into captivity. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Man, we don't have the same warfare. We don't, our, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but it is mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. Stronghold is a conclusion that you've come up with. That's not true. I'll never have victory over pornography. Yes, you can. You can live a victorious life. And what, what's the key? taking your thoughts into captivity. Now, there's something I give right here that is life-changing. It changed my life. The four-second principle. I heard it from somebody else. I didn't come up with it. You have four seconds to deal with your temptation. When that temptation comes in your mind, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, if you have not dealt with that thought that has come into your mind, it turns into a desire. Desire turns into an action. Actions turns into habits. Habits turn into character, and character turns into a destiny. You have got to take your thoughts into captivity. If you do not take your thoughts into captivity, you will never live the victorious Christian life. It is very difficult to change habits. It's hard to take your desires or your actions and change them. The key to the victorious Christian life and changing your life is taking
in your thoughts. And you've got four seconds, the four second rule. And O stands for omnipresence of God. Now I use for this Genesis chapter 39, verses 7 through 12. Genesis 39, 7 through 12. Life of Joseph. Joseph didn't have a good church. Joseph didn't come from a good family. Joseph never went to a Christian camp. Joseph never went to Christian college. Joseph didn't have the Bible, folks. But Joseph defeated temptation. How did he do it? I believe he understood the omnipresence of God. That when he's all alone in that home, or he or she thought, Potiphar's wife says, we're all alone in the house. No, ma'am, we're not. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He knew God is with me right now. And i got to tell you something. You're not going to get involved with the wrong activity sexually if your mother's with you. If, if, if uh, the dean of women is with you, if the dean of men is with you, okay, chances are, if your pastor's with you, chances are you're not going to get in sexual activity. Well, I guarantee you, your pastor may not be there. The deans may not be there. Your parents may not be there. But God is. And the omnipresence of God in your life will keep you away from sin. God's looking at that same computer screen that you're looking at, a holy God who created the world and saved your soul is looking at your telephone while you look at your telephone. The omnipresence of God will keep you away from sin. R is run from sin. Get out of there. I put down Proverbs 4.15. Move, avoid it, pass not by it. Get away from it. Flee fornication, the Bible says. Uh, run from it, Proverbs 4.15. Get away from it. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you will ever do isn't resist temptation, it's run from temptation. And the older that I get, if I developed any spiritual maturity in my life, I've learned this. It's not the resisting of temptation that matters. It's the running from temptation that matters. Get out of there. Get away from it. Turn it off. Get to another room. Start doing something else. I'll explain that in just a moment. And then yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 8, 13. Romans 8, 13. And I do want to really quickly, I want to read that verse to you. Romans 8, 13. I think this is one of the most important verses on sanctification in the entire Bible. Listen to this verse. Make sure you have it down. Romans 8, 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But listen to this. But if... There's the possibility of sanctification. Ye through the Spirit, there's the power of sanctification. Do mortify the deeds of the body, there's the process of sanctification. Ye shall live, there's the promise of sanctification. The key to having victory over temptation and over sin is the Holy Spirit. God gave you a power to overcome temptation. If you take V-I-C-T-O-R and you practice it, you'll be a failure. Brother Shetler, you just said this is how to, I got vigilance, I imagine the consequences, I cry out to God, I take my thoughts into captivity, I believe in the omnipresence of God. Yeah, you'll do it for a little bit, but you'll fall, you'll fall and you'll fail. What you have to have is the power of the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Holy Spirit of God. So Brother Shetler, I don't understand. Okay, you're being vigilant. You're being watchful, but a temptation comes into your life. That thought comes back. Images from the past, what you saw, whatever, comes back up again. What do you do? You cry out to God. God, help me right now. And here's what I believe, student. I believe at the moment that you cry out to God, God will give you a step to take. It's impossible to please God without faith. So he will show you the step to take. If you take that step, God will give you victory over that sin. If you refuse to take that step, he is not obligated to help you. But if you take the step that he, he might start saying, pray about this person, start singing the song, quote this verse, get out of here, turn it off. He will give you a small step. And if you take that small step by faith, God, I'm really struggling with this temptation. Do this right now. If you do that, he will give you the power. Yield to the Spirit of God when he gives you a step to take, and you will find victory. Now, this is going to be one of the questions on your final exam, on your essay. How do you overcome sexual perversion? How do you come overcome sexual addiction? You will give them many of the things that we covered today, but the key is this acrostic. 
V is for vigilance, 1 Peter 5, 8. Imagine the consequences, Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Cry out to God, Psalm 34, 6. Take your thoughts into captivity, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. Omnipresence of God, Genesis 39, 7 through 12. Run from the sin, Proverbs 4, 15. Yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 13, and you can see victory. By the way, I'm sure you've put this together already. You know, Dr. Shuttler, this acrostic doesn't just work for sexual addiction. This works for every area you've covered this semester. It does. So I thought we would end the entire semester with victory. V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. You practice this and listen. Somebody practices V-I-C-T-O-R-Y, these biblical principles on how to overcome and how to be victorious over temptation, they then will change their behavior biblically.